All right, people, y'all know what it is. Back here, JL Unlimited, doing another interview. We are here in Savannah, Georgia, down here at the... You say it. All right. <laughs> uh, hey, what's going on, people? CJ with Legacy Track Days. We're here at the Honda Yamaha Triumph Kawasaki dealer uh, of Savannah, and we are here in uh, Savannah, Georgia, just uh, marketing our product, letting people know how great of a track day we offer and uh, what the what the process of becoming a track day rider is and uh, getting the word out so people can come out and have a good time with us. So that's what we're doing. So the people who don't know who you are, tell them who you are, and we'll backtrack on that because actually that's what we're here to do. But people don't actually know what Legacy Track Day is, what you've been doing behind the scenes, who the people you've touched on and off the track. So we're going to cover all that within whatever time frame we have, because we are here doing our thug fizzle down here in Savannah, Georgia, came out with Legacy Track Days, doing a very, very good event, bringing out the average day rider who may not have little to no track experience and getting them to a controlled environment to where they have safe coaches, safe environment, good leadership, a uh, working bike, and able to leave your organization, your track day organization, with a better knowledge of themselves, their motorcycle, and that bond that we all hold dear. And, uh, you know, I, I'd like to I'd like to refer to that as your personal glory, because um, at the end of the day, I've had a few of those. No, yeah, <laughs> no, no, I didn't say glory hole. Um, <laughs> <laughs> sorry. Um, so, look, th this is what it is. Uh, Legacy Track Days was formed out of a strong need in the southeastern region of the United States for a solid, safe track day. Uh, just to give you guys a quick idea of what's evolved in the two years since our inception, we are currently the only and only ever uh, sponsored track day organization by the American Motorcyclist Association. That's the AMA people. Yes. Um, that, that's the people who bring you races every weekend along with Moto America and the Crave Group. Now, just to give you an idea of the other kind of people that uh, get behind us, you know, uh, TOBC Racing is one of our biggest supporters. Um, they've, they, you know, Michelle is a beautiful person and a great friend. And, uh, she, she has been avid about how strong, uh, she, she wants to be behind us. Um, you know, it, it's people like that, that make racing worthwhile. Uh, I was good friends with her, uh, former fiance who passed away, uh, uh, a little over a year ago at VIR in a plane crash. I um, got a chance to meet him once, yeah, only once. Huh? John, John Couch was an amazing individual. And he's he's one of the reasons why I wanted to get into uh, the deeper end of road racing, you know, uh, to see the kind of passion he had for the sport. But I also have to I have to give ups to uh, Roger Lyle, Motorcycle Excitement uh, Road Racing School of Track Days, um, because that's where I started uh, with track days and, and racing and coaching and, you know, taking the values that I learned from him and applying them to my own organization. Because the fact of the matter is, is that, there are too many organizations out there that are uh, you know, second rate. And I hate to use that term, but they, they, it is what it is. I mean, like call them out. I'm, I will call them out. I, I'm not going to call out. Anybody. <laughs> I'm not going to call out anybody specific. Uh, as much as <laughs> it's Cody. Who oh, I didn't know. I don't, I don't know that guy. Um, you know, I, I, the fact of the matter is this, you know, there, there, there are unsafe organizations and then there are organizations that wish they were safe. Uh, we are none of the above. We are the organization that the reason why we got the backing that we got and the support that we have from major companies, uh, Moto D Racing is one of our first sponsors. Um, Scott, Pit, Scott, Scott, uh, Scott Diamond is an amazing guy. Yeah. Uh, Pit X Speed Parts. Uh, they, they found out that we were doing something big and they wanted to be part of that and they saw it. Um, you know, we, we've got, you know, with, with Nate Kearns pulling out of Roebling Road, there's an opportunity here in Georgia for us to really bring something big to the table. Um, you know, uh, this isn't about bragging or anything, but, you know, with 1400 people on my friends list on Facebook and almost a thousand people on, 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 uh, the, the legacy page itself, you know, that, that was done purely to, to get the word out, to let people know that there, there's something going on here that's bigger than everybody. And, and when it goes, when it blows up, it's going to blow up in a way that no one's even really ready for at this point. Uh, even myself, um, I'm ready for it. 
I mean, I'm ready for it, <laughs> but I don't know. I, I mean, I mean, it's, it's going to be big when it, when it goes, it's going to go. Um, but here's the thing, right? I've got 30 years on two wheels. A lot of people don't know a lot about my history. They just know I'm a dude that has a, a, a tractor organization, but I got 30 years on two wheels. Um, I've got over a decade uh, racing and then coaching and all the things that, that, that made me who I am, track day rider, street rider. Uh, you know, I've ridden everything from buckets like uh, a, a, a 94 Katana all the way up to, you know, the cream of the crop. Uh, I had a, a my, I wouldn't even put that on my resume. <laughs> hey, that, thing had, that thing had a stage three jet kit, colder plugs, advanced ignition. And that thing was a beast when it was reliable. <laughs> when it was reliable back in 94, back in, back in, back in 95, after 95, things kind of fell off, and, you know, but, uh, you know, I've, I've ridden just about every kind of motorcycle there is, um, enduros dual sports you know uh super moto bikes um cruisers sport bikes uh i've even been on a couple of drag bikes although i, I wouldn't brag about any of my times because uh you know somebody was finished and back in the pits before i got done with my run wow uh, you know, <laughs> i mean you know not really but i mean you know not too far from it um but look, here it is, people. You know, we do this because we care about the the future of the sport. Um, we do this because we care about the the safety that is involved with being a rider. You know, you got so many guys out there that they, you know they want to be Valentino, they want to be Marquez, they want to be Lorenzo, and they they get on these one thousands and they're killing themselves on the street. They're not wearing the right gear. They're bringing their bikes to the track, trying to be, you know, the best guy out there. And they wind up high siding and helicopter flight. Now, I don't know about you, but if I'm going to take a helicopter ride, I want it to be of my own volition. Really? Not, not because I'm conscious, unconscious on the side of a berm yeah. at a track that's, you know, it's seven hours away from my house. Yeah, yeah definitely. Um, and that won't happen you know, if you if you really grasp a hold of what the reality of your abilities is, you can be a monster street rider and be a terrible track rider. I was. I got on the track thinking I was the man. And after three sessions of intermediate, I realized very quickly and almost abruptly that I was not the man and that I was so far from the man that, you know, I was starting to check my own manhood to make sure that I had, you know, a bag, not ovaries. <laughs> Um, Your cojones wasn't left in turn. Nah, nah. my, my, my huevos were cracked. <laughs> um, and, and, you know, it took it took a lot of time, a lot of seat time on a 600. I didn't do my first track day on a 1000. I didn't do my 100th track day on a 1000. I didn't do my 500th track day on a 1000. I occasionally went and took buddies' bikes out that were 1000s just to play around to see what it felt like. But I am a firm believer that if you're not a master from the beginning, then there's no way you can be a master in the end. Definitely. And Definitely. there's no such thing as a master unless you're riding a two and a half million dollar piece of machinery, because there is not one of us out there on the track right now, anywhere in the United States that can prove beyond the shadow of a doubt that they're ready to get on one of those MotoGP machines. That's why we don't have an American MotoGP racer. That's why we don't have an American MotoGP champion and haven't in several years. The reason why we Come don't... back to me, Ben Spees. Come back to me. Somebody, anybody. I'll take Maladin back. You know, something. <laughs> no, you keep Maladin. No, keep Maladin. No, nah, man. No, nah, man. Don't be mad. Don't be mad. <laughs> He's an Aussie, but he was a beast. <laughs> but listen, you know, the fact of the matter is, is that you, you got guys out there that are ready to go to the next level and they're being held back by their own ego. I mean, I mean, just to say on that, just to, just to piggyback on that, like I said, with your track day organization and what you experience and stuff that you have, we can bring, we could possibly bring up somebody if they go through the right courses, if they go through the right, uh, let's say channels, um, the people that, you know, with, uh, TOBC, uh, people I know through Graves, Yamaha, uh, and other places, uh, Dane Westby team, stuff like that, they're looking for the next rider to potentially take uh, a, a good seat. We've talked about, uh, side note, we kind of talked about Tony coming, kind of backing down. I think it was actually a pay cut in, in my eyes. I think it was actually a pay cut. Oh, to Tony actually come, uh, yeah, Tony at least to come down and kind of play around with us. That's literally what he's doing. He's literally playing around with us. Then to get, you know, two wins at Coda, it's kind of like, wow, you know, that's, that's for us to kind of let us know 
we need to step up our game a little bit. Well, I mean, that shows you that a guy who's never ridden that track. Um, well, I think he did. I think no, he did no, no, with no. Moto Two. No, 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 that was his first time at Coda, if I remember hearing uh, Greg White and Jason Bridmore when they were doing the uh, back and forth uh, during the commentary. That's the commentary. So, okay, so I, I, I believe. Don't quote me, people. <laughs> I believe Greg White and Jason Bridmore had the conversation about Tony Elias that this was his first time riding at Coda. Now, obviously, he was there for you know several days in advance for testing That's and whatnot. Right. Yeah, yeah. But the fact of the matter is, is that first of all, I would like to give some ups to uh, to Yashimura Suzuki because they deserved to have some bikes on the podium after a long time. They've been fighting them Yamahas, and they've been fighting Josh Hayes and Josh Heron and Cameron Bobier, and I mean these are guys that I, I, I've Jake watched. was charging. I see Jake charging. I, I, I'm telling you, I, I know Jake personally. Jake Lewis, uh, get well soon. I've seen Jake when he first jumped on with KWS. Uh, I actually saw his bike before he did. Long story short, uh, we had a Roman Roads where I was meeting up with Jake and uh, Garrett. Oh, uh, Gerloff. Yeah. I love that guy. Garrett. <laughs> Garrett's crazy. So I'm, I'm actually over at KWS. I had a mechanical problem. So I'm calling up uh, Kevin and everybody over there. I was like, hey, I need this, this part switched out. It was like, hey, we're open, but you have to do it yourself. Not a problem. I'm a monkey wrench. I have no problem with that. Go over there. They're finishing up uh, a brand new spanking, sparkly new R6. I'm like, oh, whose nice little trinket is this? They was like, Jake. Like, Jake Lewis? I said, wait, wait a minute. Isn't he not old enough to ride it? They're like, yeah, he's going to be racing uh, Roman Rhodes this weekend. Wait a minute. I'm going to be at Roman Rhodes. He's not racing the same track I'm racing. They was like, get ready for a butt whooping. And best believe I did. That boy ran down the track record like a carrot and dangling in front of him. No joke. Then, I remember that. <laughs> then to top it off, Garrett jumps on board and like, ooh, you do one, I could do one better. You know, you know they actually swapped out mm-hmm. track records for like yep. three times. So... Jake Lewis, love you guy. Uh, get get well better soon. Uh, but yeah, Yoshimura has been has been steaming to get back on the podium, or if not just a win, to stay constant on the podium. Yep, and to get that double header, both bikes top and you know, top and middle, back to back at a track like Coda. I mean, you you can't you can't buy better press than that. Yeah, and you right. know you know the rule: uh, first on Sunday, bought on Monday. Um, you know, everybody's everybody's sitting there making jokes about you know you're gay if you you uh, you ride a Suzuki. Well, let me tell you what: if if riding a Suzuki is gay, call me Snowflake Sunshine and, and, and color me in rainbows because I have a I have a Jixer and I'm not ashamed of it. And you know, I ain't got no problems getting on the track uh, and and riding uh, uh, my Jixer with pride um, because now I got something I can go. Oh yeah. Oh, yeah? Well, check out Hayden and Elias and, and, and come talk smack. Take that. And, and just so that you guys understand, I don't know how many of you got a chance to pay attention to the commentary. The bikes that they're on, uh, when they do their numbers, when they do the diagnostics uh, off of the computers, when they download everything, they're still showing Maladin and Spees. Uh, so that tells you how old those bikes are. They're running on 2009 machines with 2009 programs. And uh, they just swept a weekend on the first weekend uh, and, 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 you know, of course you, you, you had some luck in, in some sense and Roger Hayden, let's be honest, man, he really did deserve that first race. Um, but Tony Elias, you know, he, he, he had an issue, the red flag worked in his favor and he jumped on that bike when they, when they came back out off that red flag and he manhandled everybody. Yeah. He, he let everybody know that he was not, he was not here just to ride for a weekend. He was here to let y'all know, um, yeah, I'm coming in and I'm taking over. Um, damn, damn y'all R1s and, and, and damn, damn y'all, damn y'all KTMs and damn y'all Kawasaki's. You didn't see a Kawasaki up on the podium. You didn't see, no, you saw two Suzuki's and a Yamaha and that was it. So you better believe that Suzuki is really, really going to work hard to get that 17 out because, they, that seventeen is already, that, that the base mo- model for that seventeen is already proven dividends over at MotoGP. Yeah, so I mean, yeah. they they came out swinging and you know top four, top five, back to back 
you know, in the first couple of MotoGP races. And then you got geniuses like the Vicioso getting taken out by his own teammate. I, you know, I, I, I mean, That's another conversation. Yeah, we have that conversation. We, we, <laughs> sidebar, sidebar. Uh, no, look, look, here it is. Here it is in a nutshell. Um, Legacy Track Days was formed out of necessity. Um, necessity for safety, necessity for education, necessity for a place that people don't have to feel like they're being uh, scrutinized for everything they do. Or taken advantage of. Taken advantage of. Uh, you know, yeah, we need to make money so we can stay in business. Yeah, we need to book events so that we can get more money so that we can continue to stay in business. But at the end of the day, I'm not I, I'm about the money, but I'm not about the money. I, I want I, I need your money so that I can continue to provide what it is that I want to provide. And the fact of the matter is, is if I make enough money to provide those events and make a living doing it, I got no problem with that, because that means me making more events, being at the track more, being on the track more and working with people and getting those beginners into a safe environment and making them better riders so that they can grow not only as riders on the track, but as riders on the street, because a day on the track is worth a year on the street all day. So let's talk about uh, Legacy Track Days, how it was formed. Like I said, me and you, we, we've only known each other personally for a couple of months. Yep. Literally a couple of months. But you're a New Yorker. I'm a New Yorker. Just that click had, had, <laughs> has, been, <laughs> has been phenomenal. Now, before that, when you left New York or left the upper states to come down to Florida, why was that? Why did you actually leave something that was potentially doable? You know, you had fun up there. You, you learned a lot. Why come down all the way down to Florida and start a track day organization event that already had one, two, three, almost five track day organizers in your backyard? Well, let's be honest. Uh, the reality is, is that initially I didn't come down to Florida for uh, to do track days. Um, I came down to Florida because I have children that live here um, and I wanted to be close to my kids because without going into a lot of detail, um, I, I was I was not provided an opportunity to be uh, a, a father to my children at a young age. Um, and I wasn't going to continue to let that slide. Um, so I moved down here with them in mind. Now, what wound up happening is I wound up going to uh, a couple of track days with a particular organization that I will not name because I am not going to be that guy. Um, <laughs> as much as I want to be that guy, I will not be that guy. Say thank you. <laughs> and and I, watched, I watched a cavalcade of, of complete and utter chaos, uh, uh, lap after lap, group after group. And it only took once, and it was at Homestead. And I looked at my wife, and I said, Honey, this place needs... It needs uh, needs us. This place needs an organization like the one we just came from that we spent years working with and, and with the kind of uh, uh, record that they have in safety uh, and, and the love and the passion and the family environment that uh, that, that, that we came from. And uh, so that's what we did. We brought that down here. And, you know, I, I, right now everything's out of pocket, you know we're, we're every time we, we do a track day, there's a risk that we can lose everything. Uh, every time we do a track day, there's a risk that I lose so much money that I can't recover and, and that I may not be able to do another one. Um, you know, track days aren't cheap. You're talking in the, you know, uh, anywhere from, and, and, yeah, yeah. I mean the, the cheapest event that I'm doing right now is actually Roebling road and it's a two day and that one's still going to cost me almost $14,000. Uh, when I, when all is said and done, wow. and if I don't make my numbers, you won't see me again. I mean, that's the reality of it. And I hate to sound like that, but you know, I've, I've had opportunities for investment, uh, and, and for one reason or another, the investors didn't pan out. Uh, and, and we don't need to go into detail about that. Um, other than eventually the right person will come along and they will see the value in what we bring and they will see the people that we have behind us and they will realize that. Like myself. Yeah, like, like that guy right there. Oh, uh, you can't see. The guy across the table from me. Um, you know, so that's 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 the biggest thing we're missing right now is funding. Because um, everything is out of pocket, and I'm not a rich man. But I'm, I'm, I'm rich with the love of this sport, and I do what I do because I love this sport, and I do what I do because I'm, I'm 
hashtag bike life all the way. I, I mean, every time something comes up from like eight or nine or 10 years ago on Facebook or whatever it is, comes up, you know, you have a memory and it'll be me on a bike. It'll be me at the track. It'll be me with my boys that I used to ride with on the street. And, and like every single picture is me on a bike, something to do with bikes, you know, and, and when you can say that, you know, over a decade, you know, you know, I'm serious. I'm for real. I'm about what I'm about. And, you know, I'm a CCS and ASRA racer. Um, I'm a coach. Uh, I'm an owner. Um, I'm a street rider. I'm a track day rider. And I'm an enthusiast. And I'm an enthusiast in a way that makes people understand that I do what I do because I love this sport. And I want this sport to survive. It almost died. And when it almost died... I almost died when I lost connection with Jordan Motorsports, who was the the reason why I wanted even more to be in the paddock because of the, the camaraderie that came with being around those guys and the camaraderie that I saw with all of the racers. And, you know, on the track, they're mortal enemies and you get them in the paddock and they're spraying champagne on each other and they're having a good time and they're enjoying. I want that for everybody. I want to bring that race feel to the track day. And when I can do that, when I have enough involved and I have enough investment backing us up so that we can bring the kind of event that I'm only dreaming of right now, you know, obviously the safety is, is up front, but the full fledged, you know, the, the, the grandeur of a race day. So when a track day rider comes out and doesn't feel alone, doesn't feel like he's there by himself, has support, the banners everywhere, the big trucks everywhere so that they can see, Oh, this, this guy's about business. This guy isn't about the money. This guy's about the sport. And that's what it is. I'm about the sport and I'm about the salvation of the sport. And unfortunately, even though Crave and Moto America are doing big things and I am so completely behind those guys and I hope to do something with them in the next season or two. Um, the reality is this, if they don't succeed this sport dies because there's nobody big enough that is going to take the reins after the demise of what was done by the previous organization that was in control of AMA Pro Road Racing. I'm shaking my head so much right about now. I could be continue talking, but you see me shaking my head oh, so yeah, much. No, I'm trying like, not to laugh. Oh my you... People don't understand. It's just like when I, I don't care. It's my show. I'm going to call people out. When DMG took over the AMA license, and I found out that's just kind of like, wait a minute, aren't you guys going to change the name? I called them up, and I'm just like, aren't you guys going to change the name to DMG Motorsports, whatever the case may be? You know, change it from AMA Pro to whatever you want to. It's yours now. Change it up. Make ind Individualize it. And they didn't do it. They just carried everything over. That, for me, waved a red flag. I'm just kind of like, that doesn't sound right. Well, it's because they didn't want to accept any culpability for, for what they were doing. And they ran it into the ground and letting, spe you know, not, not putting stipulations on the contracts that Speed Channel was carrying, not putting stipulations on the contracts for any kind of televising of the sport. And then progressively more and more, you were losing races. You weren't, you know, you had to wait two weeks on cable to see a, a race that happened. You well, you see it three o'clock in the morning on a Wednesday. Who's going to watch a on, race? On a channel that nobody has because you don't have that package. So you got to pay an extra $30 a month to have that package. And it's like, you know what? Seriously, like they, they, I think, and I hate to say it, but I think to some degree it was intentional sabotage. I believe so. Because you, you had I'm not the only one who felt the same way. Yeah. And I, yeah. I'm not anybody, only. anybody who knows how this, you know, the last 10 years went in, in road racing in the United States knows that it went from being top shelf, you know, you could catch a Daytona race, you know, you could catch and see, see guys like Eslick slide that, slide that Geico Suzuki through the turn like it was a dirt bike and, and catch wheel and go. And, and, or you got guys like Maladin, you got guys like Spees, you got guys like Hayes, you got guys like all of the Hayden brothers. You got, I mean, these guys, Bostroms, both of the Bostrom boys, you, know, you got guys that were out there doing it and making it big. And you had somebody on the other side that was basically wrapping their lips around NASCAR's private areas. 
And uh, my daughters are in the room, guys. Um, you, you couldn't you you couldn't catch a race. Yeah. And it, you had you got to pray. You got a DVR or yeah. TiVo or something. something. Yeah. Because you're not seeing a race. And if you wanted to, if you, in most cases, towards the end, before it lost televised uh, 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 network play, and Speed Channel became Fox, and Fox became CBS, and CBS became this. CBS, Fox, CBS News, Fox News, CBS. I mean, you, you, yeah, you couldn't yeah. keep track of who was running what. Yeah. And every time somebody else picked it up, you had to buy another membership or buy another, another package. Another yeah. package. Oh, you didn't come with this. You got oh, it's not on the, oh, it's not on this uh, section over here. Now you have to go and buy a, 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 a cable vision. Set. Uh -huh. Oh, it's not on Direct TV. Now you got to go with Dish. Oh, we don't have Dish anymore because Dish sold out to somebody else. It's it's it was a it was a chess game. It was one thing after another, <laughs> and then when when National Guard pulled out and said, "There's no more reason for us to be here," and Geico was about to pull out, and Jordan said, "If National Guard goes, we go," and people can hate on the Jordan team all they want, but. I know a lot of people don't realize that the level playing field that became available in the privateer level came available because of Jordan fighting yep. to get open available Ability. options yep. for all the stuff that the factory teams were using that they weren't disclosing or allowing privateer teams to get their hands on. Yep. Now, mind you, Jordan's team was spending a lot of money. He was spending a million dollars of his own money yep. at the beginning of the year. Yep. So, I mean, that was part of not just their purse, but that was part of their startup money. So, I mean, a million dollars on a privateer team isn't piddles, but is not the whole kit and caboodle to what you need to run a full team on for the year. Yep. That's why he still had uh, Gatorade. He still had uh, yeah, upper Leo, deck, yeah, upper Leo deck Vance, and stuff like that. Yeah. Leo Vinci. Uh, he had all those guys still sponsoring the team because it does, it takes more than a million dollars to run absolutely a, a team for the full year. And you know all the support that they gave the National Guard, all oh, the support yeah. that they gave to all of their vendors, all of their sponsors. And the fact of the matter is, if it wasn't for the Jordan team, and people can hate me for saying this if they want to, but if it wasn't for the Jordan team it wouldn't have stayed as big as it did for as long as it did because people would come to the track just to see if Jordan would show so, up. I remember the one year, I know I'm showing my A's, the one year when Jake actually won it. He won the 200. At Jersey? No. Oh, no, no, at Daytona. At, at Daytona. No, I didn't forget about that. It's just like he won it legitimately underrated. He was a completely underrated team, underrated rider, People said that, you know, a lot of people said that he was over the hill. He was only 33, 35, maybe, maybe 35 at the time. So, I mean, maybe he could have been a, a little bit older than everybody else. But, I mean, because Danny Eslick was still in his early 20s. Oh, and Hayes. Uh, and he, Hayes was still, what's this? Hayes was still about the same age. About, about, you're right. Zemke's only like a, a year or yeah, two. A year or two. A year or two different. Yeah, they're only about a year or two difference. But, I mean, they was thinking, like, Jemke didn't have a shot, even racing with Jordan team. He didn't have a shot. So when he came up and actually won it. Oh, everybody stopped. Oh, what? With a five-second lead, five-second gap. So you can't say, oh, he drafted off of this, yada, yada, yada. He drove that bike to the winner's circle. And then less than two years later, all hell breaks loose. I mean, you look at you look at the you look at the evolution of Jordan and the de-evolution of uh, pro racing in this yep. country. They happen simultaneously. Yep. And the reason why they happen simultaneously is because guys that needed the ability to run couldn't run, and guys that had the ability look at look at what happened with Steve Rapp. Steve Rapp is a monster. Love Steve well, Rapp. So underrated. I've only met him once, but Steve Rapp, if you remember, I was at Road Atlanta. Missed talking with you. Steve Rapp was so underrated and as one of Jordan's first pro riders. Besides Jason. Besides, well, but. Jason, it, was, it was those two. Jason. Those two together. Yep. Yeah, 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 um, you know, Rapp was so underrated and he, but the, him and him and him and JP both, they, they couldn't, they couldn't do what they needed to do because they couldn't get what they needed to get. Jay, I remember Jason even saying that um, he interviewed, he said, if he had the better equipment, he would be able to not just lead the, the team and be able to be up front, but would be able to win a race. And if I remember right, that next year, or maybe the year before, when Jim Key actually won it, 
Jason did re did lead the 200 for I think it was like five laps. Yep. That was the first time a privateer, privateer, keyword privateer, has ever led a 200. Yep. Jason, next time I see you, I'm going to remind you of that because he goes to Roman Road often. I'm going to remind you of that. You are a hero of mine to ask you to do something like that. And he said if he had the equipment, just slightly better equipment, he would probably be able to win a race. Well, JP knows that uh, me and my wife, Jenny, uh, we're like family. Um, JP and, and my wife and I have a great, uh, awesome, hysterical relationship. Uh, there's some weird ties that I, I'm not going to go into publicly, but, <laughs> but JP knows and, and my wife knows what we're talking about. I told everybody else, is like, this is the person who is behind the scenes, who knows a lot of people. So when they hear this interview, they'll kind of be like, holy cow, he does know all these people. Like I said, for me, uh, yeah. I, I know Russell from three degrees of separation. Yeah. Uh, but, you know, I know Russell. Well, look, it, this is this is what it boils down to is people, you know, you, you, you may not have heard of me. You may not know me. I'm not a famous person. I'm not a pro racer. I'm not anybody other than myself. But I can tell you what. I've been hanging out in the pro paddock since guys were coming out of Weira and CCS that are now the champions that are now running the show. And I've been watching them from day one. I remember Josh Hayes running Weira at Summit Point uh, back before he became a pro racer. So, you know, I remember watching uh, Aaron Yates back in his early days. I remember watching Matt Maladden when he first came over. I I'm telling you, these guys, a lot of these guys will know me by name or know me by face, but I've been in the pro paddock since 2007. The pro paddock, not club paddock, not, you know, not, not just track days or mock races or anything like that. I have literally been in the pro paddock meeting and greeting and hanging out and getting my name out there to racers since 2007. And that was before I had any dreams or aspirations of owning my own track day. I wanted to help develop the one I was working with. And I wound up instead because I moved down here and I couldn't work a deal out with the company that I was coaching with that I said, you know what, I'm just going to do it on my own. I'm just going to do it on my own. Let the chips fall where they may. But I am no slack and I am no slouch and I am not a hack. I am a guy that knows the sport, knows how to coach, knows how to teach, and will show you how to do it the right way. And I will give you the best advice that I can give. And if I don't have the answer, I know somebody that does. And if that person doesn't have the answer, I know his boss. <laughs> or her boss. <laughs> or, her, or her boss. Depends on how you look at it. You know, my, my wife, you know, bless her. Um, you know, she owns Speed of Life Photography. And, and, and her and her best friend, uh, uh, Diana uh, Green now, because she just got married. Um, Congratulations. They, uh, they started shooting with Motorcycle Excitement. And with her coming down and being at my side and being the authorized sole uh, photographer for Legacy and having all the support that we've had. I mean, it, it, the outcry for another track day organization in Florida and in the southeast, to be honest with you. Uh, was so big when I put it out there that I was going to start my own organization that everybody was like, man, I can't believe somebody's finally bringing out another organization. A that, good one. That we're going to have one yeah. other than this other one big guy in Florida. Um, <coughs> pardon me, that cough. Know, wow, that cough. It, it's, you know, you should, you, uh, I got some lozenge, you know. <laughs> help you out, man. Help you out. Help you out. Um, no, nah, look, you know, I, I I can't keep saying it over and over again, but the love that I have for this sport, look, uh, you can't see this, but I'm going to show Jordan this because Jordan will appreciate this. Nice. All right. What you got on my arm that I'm nice. showing him below my Italian flag is my logo for my organization that I had tattooed on my arm before I started the organization with my race number tattooed on my arm, despite whether I lose it, that's my number. Okay. You want to talk about being bike life? I'm, I'm inked with bike life and, and you know, that'll be with me forever. And there will never be a day that I don't think about being on a motorcycle. Never, ever. The day won't happen. It doesn't exist for me. Bikes are everything. Riding and racing is everything. 
being a part of that kind of a society is everything because it brings families together. It brings friends together. It transcends generations. It transcends race, color, creed, religion. It transcends everything. It doesn't matter whether you're young or old. It doesn't matter whether you're white or black. It doesn't matter what you are, gay, straight. I don't care. <laughs> if you can ride a bike, you're part of the family. You want to bring a bagger out to my event and ride in the uh, beginner group? Bet. Come on. I'll let you do it. You want to come out and just do uh, a couple of laps, because but you can't afford to do a track day? Guess what we offer? We offer a lunchtime street ride, which I got the idea from my mentor, Roger, Roger Lyle. Uh, we do a lunchtime street ride, which doesn't cost any money as long as you have full gear for, you know, street gear, jeans, uh, boots or closed toed shoes, gloves, jacket, helmet, full face, not that garbage lift up two piece nonsense. OK, <laughs> you come out and you can come and do 40, 50 mile an hour, two to three, 40 to 50 mile an hour laps around the track to see why we love it so much. And I guarantee you, your first time out there, it's going to be a fish hook in your mouth begging you to get, come back. It'll be like hooking a Marlin. It's going to fight you because you're going to sit there and go, I don't know. I can't afford it. I can't afford it. And then, then when you make do it, it's, it's, only gonna take, it's only going to take that one track day that you do, that first track day that you do that you pay for, that you get all that gear for, and you're going to do it. And you're going to go, you know what? F this. I'm never going back to the street again. I've seen it happen. I've seen it happen. I've seen it, it happen. happen. happen to me. Yeah. I had my bike. I did a couple track days. I loved it. I was like, yeah, I'm going to keep doing this. I had a wreck on the street, and I was like, yeah, I'll do a little more track days and a little less street. And then I almost got run over by a Toyota Sequoia drunk driver at 1030 at night going home, and he, tra he literally – was going 85 miles an hour on a 40 mile an hour road and literally tried to run me over. Wow. And I had to do 90 to get away from him and went past the speed trap. The cop sees me and the cop sees the Sequoia. The Sequoia is riding in two lanes. I'm riding in one. The cop pulls me over, gets me for reckless, gets me for speeding, tries to arrest me, threatens me publicly because I didn't pull over when he wanted me to. I pulled over in a gas station because there was no shoulder on the road that we were on. And I, I arrest you for that right now. And I said, you know what? I said, according to the law, I have the right to pull over where I feel safe. Yep. So I pulled over where I felt safe. I let him talk his trash. The other guy showed up and told him to shut his mouth because he was burying himself. I had a buddy of mine who was a Maryland State Police officer go and have a little chat with him. And that ticket disappeared. <laughs> It's not and what you know, it's who you know. Damn right. <laughs> and I'm going to tell you right now, I thank that man every day because that man basically kept me from going to jail for something that I didn't, that, that it wasn't right. And then later that night, that Toyota Sequoia killed three people in a car accident. Oh my goodness, don't tell me that. Because, Are you serious? Yes. Because it was on the news the following morning, on the street just past my neighborhood, Five minutes after I got pulled over, he killed somebody. Had that cop actually pulled the guy that was riding in two lanes doing 85 miles an he hour? He could have saved some people's lives. He would have lives. saved some people's lives. But he was more, he was a freshman cop. He was fresh out of the academy at maybe eight months in the field and pulled me over because he had an ego trip about bikes and came after me. And he found out real quick that I wasn't the person you should have came after because he was, oh, I could catch you whenever I want. Except I was riding on temp tags because the bike was only three weeks old. And if I wanted to get away, believe you me, I knew the neighborhood I was in. Dropped I'd have been a ghost <laughs> and my bike would have been in a garage before he didn't know what to, to be, what to do with himself. But I didn't. I stopped. I did the right thing. And I fought his butt in court and I won. They tried to run it through uh, uh make me go through a driver improvement and I lobbied against that and appealed the ticket and went and won that too. So reckless, uh, uh, double the speed limit, all that, it went away with the snap of a finger, all because I played the game right. Y'all out there running from cops. Hey, you can do what you want to do. And I'm not here to tell you what, but I'm going to tell you right now, if they get a tag number, they, they, they can show up you. at your front door because yep, now they got cameras and yep. you're going to jail. Yep. They don't so, catch you. Look, that was the pivotal moment. That was the oh poop moment. That was the I'm done with the street moment. And you bet your butt. I had an accident at the track uh, six weeks later, and I ripped every piece of street product off of the bike, the lights, the harness, everything, and I turned it into a race bike. And it never saw the street again, ever. I mean, that's the best thing for you. I mean, like I said, just with the drama and stuff that – everyday riders have on the street, no matter if you're in Savannah, Buford, Florida, Gainesville, California, Oklahoma, uh, Tennessee, doesn't matter. 
you're still going to have those elements. You're going to have that wild card at every foot of the street that is unknown or can change. Why risk yourself to that scrutiny and, and, and potential death of yourself, somebody else, innocent person, like the numbnut state trooper who pulled you over instead of pulling the drunk driver over. I mean, it's just kind of like situational awareness, I guess, more than anything. Oh, yeah. Put yourself in a better situation and definitely put yourself in an organization that's going to help you be a better writer, be a better person, improve your writing skill on and off the track. And tone your ego down because a lot of these guys come in with a heat with the ego the size of Mount Rushmore. And let me tell you, it may have been an, it, it becomes an active volcano real quick when the wrong person gets in, in your way. And then you wind up coming to the track and we make that volcano dormant. <laughs> <laughs> you, you, you stop you stop acting the fool on the street because you realize what you can do. They were at a nine. They left at a two. <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, for real, I'm not telling anybody. I'm not telling you and I will never tell you to not be a street rider. Yo, I loved riding the streets with my boys. I loved going up into the mountains. I love doing you doing just all those runs and twisties out in the middle of nowhere and having fun with 20 or 30 other bikes. You know, it, it was great and I love it and I miss it sometimes. But then I remember all of the bad things that happened, not because there were bad people, but because there were bad decisions. And it may not have been a bad decision by any one of us on a bike. It could have been the bad decision from the rider. It could have been a bad decision from people. the you know the, the the car that turned out and pulled in front of somebody, or like my best friend from high school, Chris DeBille, had his had his, had his friend on the back of the bike was going through a mountain road. He was actually one of the uh, uh, throttle control members. Um, he uh, he went down by himself, with just just his, his friend on the back of the bike, and it was a little low side mm. on a mountain road. And he hit some gravel and he low sided and he died. Wow. And he died. And, and it killed me because I moved down here and started my track day organization just before that happened. Oh and, or no, I'm sorry, just after that happened. And I wish that I would have started it sooner because he might still be alive. If I'd have got him on the track and, and showed him a safer way to be, he might still be alive. I'm not saying he would have stopped riding on the street, but I mean, look at everybody we've lost just on the track that didn't die on the track. Yeah. Look at Dane Westby. Yeah. He didn't die on the track. Aquino. Yeah, Tommy, Tommy Aquino. Aquino. Yeah. He didn't die on the track. Carrie, bless your heart. You're a beautiful person. And I feel for you every day because we all miss Tommy. Uh, Patricia and Trig and all you guys, we all miss Dane. We miss everybody. You know, Bernat, uh, you know, the, all of them. You know, every day I look up in the sky and I think, that these guys are looking down and seeing what I'm doing and saying, you know, that guy's doing the right thing. Uh, Al Wilcox, airborne Al Wilcox, man died after living a full life. Man, that man rode in the 1930s as a factory Harley racer on the beach at Daytona before there was a Daytona 200. <laughs> and they rode with no brakes. And I am not kidding you, no brakes. At all. <laughs> on the beach, on the sand, on street bikes. I remember, yeah. Okay? These guys were <laughs> monsters. And this man was maybe five feet tall and had a personality ten feet tall. The stories that man told were beautiful, and the thoughts that man gave were beautiful. Steve Fowler, another great guy from up north at the club level, and an and old school pro, pro racer. These guys are all gone, and most of them, you know, with the exception of Al, most of them are gone because of somebody else's error. Yep. Not their own. Yep. They didn't die because they were out being stupid. They died because somebody else was being stupid. They they found out. Uh... Now, since they released everything, uh, uh, was it, not Oklahoma, um, where where Dane passed away at, uh, literally like two blocks away from his house, they initially thought it was him. Then they found out later on, after further investigation, that he was actually was something. avoiding someone. Yep. Uh, they don't know if it was a drunk driver or not, but he actually was avoiding someone and lost control of the motorcycle. Mind you, this is a guy who rode his bicycle Everywhere, everywhere. No, no, no. no. Every he day. rode his bicycle from where he lived 
to Daytona <laughs> and somehow managed to survive a, a multi-state thousand plus mile bicycle ride so he could support Patricia at Daytona. Yeah. I think it was his first ride at Daytona. And you're going to tell me that something, some, they tried to put it on. So, oh, yeah, it was, he was speed related or it was this related or that. You know what? I don't care what it was. There was a guy who was the one of the best guys in the paddock that that was a beautiful person with a great personality, and he was taken too early. Way too early. Aquino. Way, way too early. Tommy, oh, way, way too early. Way too early. Way, I mean, he just got his win. He just got his win. In, oh. uh, was it British Super Sport Bike or World Super Bike? Uh, he had superstock. He had, you know, he had, he had oh, he was, forty bike. Oh, he had. You know, he had great sponsorship. He had a beautiful he had family team. behind him. He had a great him. team. Behind you know, yeah. uh, uh, Yamalube was a great team behind Dane. Yeah. You know, all these guys they were getting ready to break into their prime, and they were stolen from us. And that's why I do what I do because I'm trying to keep one more person from being stolen from us. I'm trying. I'm getting sick and tired of every time I open Facebook. Uh, Three or four or five more people are dead in Florida because they're either they're either out doing something they shouldn't be doing, or somebody is out there doing something they shouldn't be doing, and they become the victim of it. And you know what? Okay, cool. Yeah, not everybody is at fault. Not everybody is not at fault. But there are a lot of things we could be doing to protect it. ourselves yeah. and to change it. Yeah. And part of that is growing as a rider and saying, "I don't need to go to the track." That's just blindness. That's just saying, that's like saying, oh, here's, I'm going to give you a ticket that I know is a winning lottery ticket, but, but the, the only, well, deal, but the only, the only deal is you got to scratch it off. Yeah. I'm going to give you a winning lottery ticket, but you got to scratch it off. <laughs> well, I don't want to scratch it off. I don't need to scratch it off. Okay. Then I'm going to give it to somebody else that will. And it's the same concept. I'm giving you a winning ticket to come out and to ride your bike the way it was built to be ridden, the way it was designed. And all I need you to do is show up. Show up, tell your friends, bring your family, bring your kids, bring your dog. I don't care. <laughs> bring your Uncle Josephus. I, I don't care who you bring. You but mean Cleophus. <laughs> Josephus, Cletus, I don't care who you bring. Bring, <laughs> you understand? Uh, uh, bring whoever you got to bring. But bring them because they want to see you be safe. You got children? Come to the track, not for you. Come to the track for the future of your children. Come to the track for the future of the sport. Come to the track for the love of the sport. I really ain't got nothing else, bro. Listen, well, we're going to wrap it up here. We we locked up a lot of time with you. Uh, I want to thank you personally, CJ, uh, for spending time with Jay on Limited oh, Radio Show. Yeah, absolutely, man. And uh, hopefully we will be able to do some more with you a little bit later on in the season, a little bit later on in the year. Oh, I, I, you'll be at Roebling. Yeah, I'm gonna be there. I'm gonna be there. Rain, talk, rain or shine. Talk, talking to the people in the paddock to yeah, talk about their yeah, experience. Yes, yeah, so we definitely gonna be doing that. We're gonna be following up with him. Uh, we, we're gonna try to sign on with Legacy Track Days, and uh, if everything goes well, who knows? We, we may be the official radio show for Legacy Track Days. Uh, like I said, we got a whole bunch of stuff going on, but uh, I want them to know where can they log on to your Facebook, Twitter, Instagram. Uh, Snapchat, let them know where they can get you at. All right, so we'll start at the top of the list. Uh, Facebook is the like the, the most common way, so we'll go from there. You can find me, CJ Cohen, um, that's capital C, capital J, space C O H E N. Uh, you can find me as Legacy Track Days, and Days has a Z on the end, not an S. Um, we also have the Legacy Track Days Forum, which is the group page. Um, you can find us on Twitter at Legacy Track Days with an S. I know it's confusing, but we won't go there. Um, on Instagram, it's Keep Legacy. On, toes. <laughs> on Instagram, it's Legacy underscore Track underscore Days with a Z again on the end. Um, Hope you guys are writing this down. <laughs> attention, attention. The website is www.legacytrackdays. That's what the G. Um, <laughs> LegacyTrackDays.com. Um, and hit me up, uh, CJ at LegacyTrackDays.com. Legacy TDS, that's Tom David Sam. Legacy TDS at gmail.com. 
I've got so many ways to contact me. I'm sure the Pope has my phone number at this point. <laughs> um, but definitely hit me up. I answer questions. If you have anything you need to know about setting your bike up for the track, shoot me a message. Shoot me a PM. Shoot me. Just don't shoot me. Um, <laughs> you know, hit me up any way, any way you can, any way you need to. I'm hit me up. Don't hit me. Shoot me up, but just don't shoot me. <laughs> exactly. exactly. I've got so many ways for people to reach me that anything you need, you can ask. Uh, really quick, uh, I, I want to say uh, uh, I wish all the best to uh, one of my favorite ladies in road racing, Miss Michelle Lindsay. Um, John Couch just had his birthday. Uh, we miss you dearly, John, another person that has been taken from us too early. Um, you know, we miss you and we love you. Uh, Michelle, you're, you're a beautiful human being and we love you. Um, Danny, I hope you're down. I hope you're up in road Atlanta right now, turning people's heads sideways. Um, and, uh, you know, uh, my wife, my wife right now is up at, uh, uh, NC bike shooting, uh, for, uh, for, uh, motorcycle excitement. Um, and she'll also be up there again for the, uh, the ladies event in, uh, June or July. I think it's, uh, I'm not sure which one, but it's either June or July, but there's, it's like TPM ladies or something like that. Uh, but hit me up on Facebook. I can get you the information. She's the one that's going to be out there shooting you, making you look fast. Uh, she's got great, she's got great deals on photos. Um, uh, and her company is speed of life. Uh, and you can find her on Facebook and you can find her on Shutterfly also. Um, you know, we're here for you. We're here for you any way you need us to be. So as you see people, uh, like I said before, if you're not following me on Facebook, JL Unlimited uh, at Facebook, or hit me up on email, JordanLongUnlimited at gmail.com. Uh, anything you want to hear, the people you want to talk to, uh, if you have a particular racer you want to get interviewed, let me know. If there is an event going on that I need to be there, I need to see you at, I need to see the company at, whatever it is, let me know. Instagram, Jordan Long Unlimited. Facebook, hit me up. Uh, I got another Instagram, uh, MR underscore LONG23. So that's another place you can hit me up at. Uh, we're going to wrap up really quick. One more thing. I just want to thank my sponsors really quick. <laughs> you got to you gotta pay bills, right? You got to pay bills. bills. Uh, so right off the bat, <laughs> I definitely want to thank the American Motorcyclists Association for all the support that they've given. Oh, I'm glad you brought that up. Keep, keep continuing about that because I just finished talking with uh, the guys at the AMA so that uh, we're now affiliated with the AMA completely, not just myself as the rider and the test rider, as Jordan Long, the test oh, rider for yeah. AMA. Uh, now we actually got signed on with the AMA so I can talk about any events and stuff they got going on, whatever I have going on. Guess what? Whatever you have going on yeah. is now <laughs> officially affiliated with Jordan Long Unlimited Radio. So, Okay. So what I was saying, uh, I want to I want to thank SFL Mini GP for all their support, Michael Correa. Uh, I want to thank Pinex Speed Parts uh, for, for coming to our events and supporting our riders. Uh, Extreme Motorsports, Keith Marquez, uh, he's been a blessing. Um, Darren Luck, former AMA Pro, who is our AMA, uh, or um, our CCS and ASRA uh, road racing school instructor. Um, the CCS and ASRA, um, I want to thank TRU, that's Track Day Rider United, um, that is a national affiliate. Um, we have with TRU, we have over a hundred dates on the East coast alone. That's, uh, a, an affiliation that will pay dividends in the long term. If you guys ride with team promotion with Glenn Goldman, or if you ride with absolute cycles, uh, cycle experience, that's Roy could We are a powerhouse controlling the East coast right now. Uh, and track day riders United uh, is, is going to blow up. We've got track days set up on the East coast, West coast, center of the country, South, North, anywhere you can think of. We've got organizations putting together track days. So look at, look them up also track day riders, United, uh, hashtag TRU. I'm telling you, 
we're not done yet and I'm not done growing. And I hope y'all find your personal glory. <laughs> All right. From that point on, we are going to sign off. Make sure you hit us up. If you haven't, if you haven't passed this message on to any writer or any non-writer, then you are doing the wrong thing. We love you guys. See you guys at the next track day. May 1st, Palm Beach International Raceway, May 14th and 15th at Roebling Road Raceway. Make sure you're there. Aye. Peace. Peace.